Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Rougarou Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Polina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello everybody and welcome to episode 418 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host Joey Coastman. I'm joined as ever by former heavyweight world title challenger, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how you doing this week, my man? I'm doing good, Joe. How about you, my man? Yeah, I'm doing okay. I'm getting over a little bit of an illness that I picked up last kind of Friday, I'd say. Uh, last Thursday, last Friday. Um, it seemed to get pretty bad around those times. Um, feeling a lot better now, but the weekend was rough. But my voice is a little bit different, I think. But anyway, we're going to soldier through. Um, let's start with the review part of the show. We're going to start here at the Rudolf Weber Arena in Oberhausen in Germany over here. Three fights to mention. Mike Perez with a TKO in the very first round. He's now 29-3 and three with a draw. That TKO came against Rashad Karamov, who's now 36-4. and four. Austin Trout, friend of the show. No doubt Trout, now 37-5 and five with a draw. Um, unanimous decision over eight rounds against Omir Rodriguez, now 13-10 and 10 with a draw. And the main event was Milan Pratt, who's now... 20 and 1. He lost his O. He was TKO'd by the undefeated Polish fighter Slawa Spoma, who's now 19 and 0, a TKO in round 10 for the WBA Intercontinental and WBO Global Super Welterweight titles. Moving now to the Polyforum Zanna Marida in Yucatan in Mexico. This one was live on DAZN over here. Um, an undefeated fighter called Angel Ayala Lardizabal. He was 16-0. and um, You know, a lot of people saw what he was doing since turning pro, ticking all the boxes, looking like a guy for the future for sure, at flyweight. Got in there with, with Felix Alvarado, though, who, as we know, is extremely, extremely tough and was going to be a really big fight, you know, a really uh, big step up, a really big... Uh, acid test if you like um but yeah anyways back to what i was saying he was it was going to be a tough tough fight etc and yeah um he managed to somehow escape with the points decision after 10 rounds i think it was 10 rounds la disabao now 17 and 0 alvarado had la disabao down in the early rounds, he should be 40 and 3. He was a 2 to 1 underdog, the experienced Alvarado, but a lot of people felt that, you know, La Dizabada, or sorry, La, La Dizabal managed to get the hometown decision against Alvarado. Um, really good fight though while it lasted. La Dizabal did certainly win a bunch of rounds, you know, in the middle of the fight. But Alvarado closed the show quite strong as well. So, um, really good fight while it lasted. And uh, Alvarado certainly not done. But yeah, 95% of people feeling like he deserved the decision. Also on that card, the return to the ring for Miguel Bushell. He was coming off two back-to-back stoppage defeats. He's now 39-3. and three. Um, He was able to get a stoppage win. A second round retirement, Diego Ruiz decided not to come out for round three. Quite surprised with that from Bichelle because, you know, Diego Ruiz is quite a durable guy. I think he'd only been stopped once in seven losses. He's now 28 and, sorry, 24 and 8 with a draw. He's been stopped for the second time. Um, Moving now to the Manchester Arena in Lancashire, United Kingdom. Over here, again, live on the zone pay-per-view. Just one fight to mention, it's the main event. KSI now 1-1, one one. Tommy Fury now 10-0 and as a pro. Unanimous decision over six rounds. Um, the referee, not the referee, the judge, Rafael Ramos, incorrectly um, added up his card to be 57-57, which, you know, ended up being 
a majority decision for Tommy Fury, but on closer inspection, they you know they added it back up and realised it was actually unanimous for Tommy Fury. Fury had a point deducted, I believe, in round two. Um, I don't know if you saw this fight, Eddie, but if you did, what did you make of it? Yeah, actually, <laughs> I actually ended up watching it, but um, to be honest, couldn't make much of it. To be to be really quite honest, it was just. I don't know what chaos I was trying to do or he was trying to prove. Um, fighting with his hands down the whole time. And he would launch like one big right hand here, one big right hand there. And then we get into a clinch. And then Tommy would, you know, he was trying to work on the inside. It just, I don't, it, it's, it's hard for me to even say, I mean, I, I would have, you know, figured Tommy won based on, um, you know, just, some of the activity, I guess, how you, I don't even know, man. It was, it, these are the kind of fights that people wouldn't want, to, wouldn't want to see when you talk about these YouTubers, when you think about these type of things. And even Tommy as a, as actual professional fighter, um, I mean, I don't know that you can blame him for what was going on because he's not super duper experienced. You know what I mean? He doesn't have a crazy uh, pedigree as a, as, as a professional fighter, nor does he as an amateur. So, I mean, you know, fighting a guy who's really unorthodox and wild and just going to do something to make the fight ugly, which I would recommend, honestly, for KSI, just to stay in the fight and not put himself in a position to get knocked out. But it's just bad to watch. It just really, it frustrates you to watch. You know, at one point, Tommy got a point for, you know, hitting behind the head and Cass, I was warned for holding. I mean, it's just like, it just got to be a little ridiculous after a while. You know what I mean? And, it, and, and, and to, to give Tommy the decision, I, I don't know, if, you know, I don't know what whether it was justified or not. I mean, I would have probably given him the decision just based off of what Cass I was trying to do and how, um, I guess, unsuccessful he was with it. But I don't know. It's just... I don't know. I, don't, I wouldn't even call that, <laughs> you know, complete boxing. I don't know, man. It's just, it was just kind of frustrating to watch at times. So, um, but I finished, the, you know, I finished it. <laughs> I watched it. I actually watched the, the fight. I even watched the, um, the uh, fight with, uh, crap, uh, what's it? Logan Paul and, and was it Dylan Dennis? I think his name is. Yeah. And, and my, and my, yeah. And that was, you know, one, the, the it was named Dylan Dennis was just basically trying to make a big, you know, shit show of it and trying to walk him down and just catch shots upside the head. And it just, it just, it just kind of was a little ridiculous, honestly, in my opinion, those two fights just, just weren't good. You know what I mean? I don't think, I don't, I don't, if that's going to be, this is why I give Jake Paul a little more respect because he seems to be a little more serious about what he's doing. You know what I'm saying? He's actually trying to be a decent fighter. So, um, but seeing these other other fights, these other two fights, I just didn't really like what I saw. To be honest, I'm not, you know, I mean, Logan Paul was, you know, you know, controlling the fight easily by just, you know, throwing his, you know, throwing punches, keeping his hands out. But like I said, there's not much you can take from it. You know what I mean? And and, and I'm giving this a little bit too much time to be honest. But you know, I don't know. And that's what I thought. What do you think about it, Joe? Yeah, I mean, look, it was what it was. Um... It wasn't a great look for boxing. Um, a lot of people, you know, were were giving KSI a chance, you know, and, and you think before the fight, like, you guys are crazy. He's going to get knocked out. He's going to lose easy. But then those same people come back after the fight, like, oh, it was really close. Oh, KSI deserved to win. And I found myself a little bit speechless. Obviously, he's got that mad style of jumping in and out and doing the star jumps and you know, a lot of hugging, which was really, really annoying to see, um, especially when I didn't think Tommy Fury's corner made enough of a big deal about that to the referee. I felt that, well, I always feel like if a referee takes a point off a fighter, uh, off of one fighter, then there's room for the other fighter to try to do something to get a point took off to kind of write it out, if you like. And I think there was grounds. As long as there's a, there's grounds to, to, to moan about something, then you can get a point took off the other way. And I think there was grounds there. I think Tommy Fury's corner should have been going crazy about the holding. I think a point would have been took off. Um, and I felt that 
during the fight. They needed to be doing that because it was too close to call. Um, I mean, a lot of people kind of... I can't remember how I scored it now, but um, I think a, I think a lot of people were sort of saying that KSI won the first three, Tommy Fury won the won the, uh, the 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 second half of the fight, four, five, and six. Some people give in Fury round three as well as four, five, and six. That's how he becomes the winner. Um, all in all, it was just too close. Um, Tommy didn't look great, but again, he was trying to force the fight. You know, I can understand that he, he, he had to really go on the front foot looking for KSI at times in that fight. Um, but yeah, it was just, I, I don't know what to make of it really. It wasn't a great look for boxing, like I say. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I can see a rematch happening just because I think Tommy Fury's not going to be able to say no to the money. But at the same time, I wouldn't mind seeing KSI against Jake Paul now. And I don't really... I mean, look, I'm a, I've, I've said it before. I'm not a massive fan of this YouTube stuff. But um, I don't mind kind of Jake Paul. And, and, and KSI did enough here by going the distance and, you know, causing a few issues with his unorthodox style to where I wouldn't mind seeing him in with Jake Paul, you know. But I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm losing myself a little bit here, but... Yeah, let, let's move on. It, it, it was what it was. Um, the less said, the better, really. And I'm not even going to talk about that that co-main event, which was just absolutely awful. Um, yeah, so KSI Tommy Fury did watch it, did get baited in because I just wanted Tommy Fury to smash him into next week, which he didn't do. And I was a little bit disappointed um, two of my nephews actually went to the fight. They travelled down on the train, you know, from from London to Manchester, and uh, you know, <laughs> they're only young. You know what I'm saying? So they were really excited, like they're YouTube fans and stuff like that, and they were really excited for the fight. Um, and then, yeah, afterwards. <laughs> they were kind of asking to me, like, you know, you know so much about boxing. Well, why didn't why didn't Tommy Fury smash him to pieces like you were saying was going to happen? And I honestly don't know what to say. <laughs> but anyway, let's move on. Let's move on. Let's go to the more serious stuff at the Fort Bend Epicenter in Rosenberg, Texas. This one was live on Sky Sports. It was live on ESPN in the US. Um... Keyshawn Davis with a win, he's now 10-0, a majority decision, which was a bit questionable, I thought he won it quite clearly unanimously, but anyway, uh, one judge didn't think so, majority decision over 10 rounds for the WBC USA and WBO Intercontinental Lightweight titles, he got in there with Nahir Albright, who's now 16-3, and three, still never been stopped. Um, I said it, you know, this fight's going to go long, Keyshawn Davis has, has seemingly gone long in the last few fights in a row, um, there was a point where I thought he potentially could get the stoppage, I think it was late on, he really hurt Albright, but failed to really capitalise on it, um, I think, you know, they're moving him quite cleverly, I've said it before, they're not throwing him in with gimme, you know, like guys that he's just going to blow out, I think he could have easily gone that route, blowing out a load of, you know, cab drivers, but... They're throwing him in with quite tough guys. And unfortunately, a lot of the fans get impatient with that. You know, I think, be patient. The guy's learning. The guy's getting better and better. But I'm seeing a lot of people saying that, you know, Keyshawn's got something missing. If you actually look, he's he's, he's only having these, these fights where people are not that impressed. When it's against a guy who's extremely durable, man. So I think we need to cut him some slack. Um... Still think he's a good fighter with a really bright future. Um, and also on the undercard, we should mention as well, Guido Vianello with a win, now 11-1 and one with a draw. But he failed to get the knockout against Curtis Harper, who's now 14-10. and 10. Um, It was an eight-round unanimous decision for Vianello. Um, yeah, a really bad fight, actually. I didn't think Vianello looked too good. Obviously, he was coming off a, coming off a loss himself last time out. Um, Curtis Harper did what he does, he's a bit of a spoiler, came in there, um, you know, soaked up some big shots, but then, I think at some point, 
in the last few rounds, he seemed like he thought, oh, there was a bit of belief there. He thought, oh, and I think there was one of the one of the rounds where he seemed to hurt Vianello quite bad in the last few seconds, but he didn't get enough time to follow up on it. But that seemed to give him an injection of energy, Curtis Harper, to finish the fight quite strong. And he tried to definitely knock Vianello out in the last couple of rounds. Um, yeah, so not very convincing from Vianello once again. I think we've we've seen him get a little bit exposed now in a couple of fights. Um, yeah, I don't think he's going to be as great as we all maybe first thought. But it's another win. Curtis Harper is tougher than he sometimes gets credit for. Um don't really know what else to say on it. You know, banks the rounds, usually gets the knockout. Maybe it will do him good going eight rounds with someone like Curtis Harper. Uh, also on the card, a man that does not mess around when it comes to banking rounds. Richard Torres, now 7-0, and another TKO. Uh, this time it was in round two against Tyrell Anthony Herndon, who's now 21-5. and five. Torres tried to get the first round KO like he always does. And... Um, Got took into round two. Um, yeah, I think Herndon was a bit annoyed with the stoppage. Thought he could have been given a bit more of a chance. But yeah, Torres just steamrolled him like he does, to be honest with you. Massive puncher. Can punch with both hands. Very exciting. And I can't wait to see him out once again. Also on the card, Giovanni Marquez, the son of Raul Marquez. He's now 7-0. and A TKO for him in round two against Dante Strayhorn, who's now 12-5 and with a draw. And the main event, Janibek Alim Kanuli, now 15-0, and a TKO for him in round six against Vincenzo Gualtieri in what was a unification for the IBF and WBO middleweight world titles. Gualtieri loses his O, loses his world title. He's now 21-1 and with a draw. Alim Kanuli started the fight quite aggressively, as we've seen many, many times with him. Um, I think Gualtieri in his game plan, was trying to get through a few early rounds and then try to come on a bit strong late on, I think. He just he seemed like he didn't want to really commit to too much early on, for me. Um, I thought that it was going to plan. A lot of people were looking at it going, wow, he's out of his depth. Wow, Alim Kanuli's all over him. Wow, the stoppage is going to be coming. But I was thinking, Gaultieri does seem like he's in control of himself here. He, he seemed like he was fighting within himself. Um, like I say, wasn't really letting his hands go with much power at all. But to me, it seemed like he was... He, he knew what was going on. Do you know what I mean? I don't think he was overawed by the occasion. It seemed to me like he was... He, he was getting on to something. But, yeah, in the end, he didn't get going. And he did end up getting stopped in that sixth round. I don't think we got to see... You know, I don't think he left it all in the ring at all. I think whatever he was planning on doing, I think he was maybe going to unleash something a little bit later on. But yeah, I don't think it was like, I don't know, I didn't really perceive it like some people did, where it was just like he was out of his depth, it was a one-sided beatdown. I didn't really see it like that. I feel like he was in some sort of control. Um, not winning the rounds, it's, it's a hard thing for me to explain, but from my eyes, I just felt like Gaultieri was fighting to tactics, fighting to a game plan, um, you know, like I say, not wanting to overcommit at all, maybe wear Alim Kanuli out a little bit, um, I don't know, but it, it didn't end up coming, you know, coming to plan for him in the end, like I say, end up getting stopped, um, and yeah, the final card to mention went down at the Gold Coast Convention Centre in Broad Beach, Queensland, Australia. Um, over here we saw Sam Goodman move to 16-0, and a unanimous decision over 12 rounds against the very tough Miguel Flores, friend of the show, now 25-5 and with a draw. And the main event, Tim Sue, now 24-0, and Brian Mendoza in the other corner now 22 and 3. It was for the WBO World Super Welterweight title. Uh, I don't know if you saw any of this, Eddie. If you didn't, maybe stay muted. But yeah, Tim Sue with a really mature performance. Um, started the fight, uh, I wouldn't say aggressively, but came out, showed respect to Mendoza. Mendoza picked up a couple of early rounds. It was quite close by the midway point. Some people, I think, even had Mendoza ahead at the midway point. But, you know, as the fight went on, 
Tim Sue found another couple gears, and you know he took he took he took uh, what what can I say control of the fight really he took control of the fight landed some big shots on Mendoza who to his credit took them there's no doubt in this guy's chin at all still never been stopped, um, but yeah Tim Sue found that energy late on and managed to pull away and I think it was quite an easy fight to score really in the, you know. In the grand scheme of things, it was quite clear to see Tim Su won this fight unanimously, and he, he he ticks another bunch of boxes. Really, this is a guy who's been a bit of a danger man, a big puncher. Um, Tim Su answered a few questions here. You know, he's durable. He's obviously fit. He he can go through the gears with with different guys in front of him with different styles. And yeah, he's he's, he's world champion already. You know what I'm saying? But this guy's future is very very bright, and this was another victory for him in which he you know proved how good he is and what he's all about but anyway that brings the review part to a close it's now time to welcome this week's special guest ladies and gentlemen please welcome the former wbo super bantamweight world champion it is of course mr isaac dog bay isaac welcome back on the show my bro ah uh, thank you so much joey Always been well. Pleasure. Yeah, yeah, no, always a pleasure having you on. I've been well, um, but when we got on the phone, I become even more well. So it's fantastic to have you back on, oh, Isaac. Thank God. We thank God. <laughs> we thank God. So Isaac, we last spoke back in February. Um, at that time, you were getting ready to fight Rabisi Ramirez. Just briefly about that fight, you managed to hit Ramirez with some brilliant shots, by the way, but ultimately. Was he perhaps a little bit better than you thought? You know what, yeah. Um, I'm not one to kind of like make excuses or, or and, 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 and whatnot, right? You know, um, first and foremost, I thank God Almighty for, you know, for the opportunities that he continues to give me and also, you know, for the gifts of life and everything else that comes with it. Um, listen, he 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 was a better man on the night, you know. Just to simply put it, um, I know I could have done more, but unfortunately, um, it didn't happen that way. But hey, it's just one of those things, and uh, I've had to go back to drawing board to you know to learn and you know take things to a different to to a different level. Well then, yeah, on to the next one. It's it's a fight back home. Isaac, back in the UK, uh, November 18th at the Manchester Arena, you'll be boxing the undefeated Nick Ball. Have you watched much of Nick, Isaac? Have you seen much of him? Yes, yes, yes. Um, when when his name was brought to the table, um, I had to go and see who he was and, you know, just check him out a bit. And yeah, uh, I think I've seen enough. And everyone, everyone I've seen give an opinion on this fight. They all think it's going to be a war. Are you expecting a war? And if it is to be a war, does that play into your hands or his? Well, when you speak of war, um, they say there has to be a war until there's peace. You know, you, you, we don't get peace until there's war. So um, whichever way it, it goes, for me, I do believe that by God's special grace, whichever way is going to go in my favor. You know, because I've been, I've been there. I've seen it all. I've been in. I've, I've, I've hit the canvas. I've gotten back up. You know, I've been through wars and and everything else. So um, it wouldn't be nothing new. Um, you know, the only thing I'm expecting is that, you know, I, I, I bring out, I, I come, I come very prepared on the night, and by God's special grace, you know, I, I take on the victory. And it's interesting you say that because obviously you have been in quite a few wars i think no one can you know uh no one can take away your toughness we've seen it so many times in the ring that's the one thing we haven't yet seen from nick ball i've seen him throw a million hooks you know and bang people out of there but i've never actually seen him in the deep end and i feel like you've been in the deep end many times we've seen you can swim there this will be his acid test um, since moving from Super Bantam to Featherweight, you've had to give away height advantages every fight. 
This is one of the main reasons I wasn't too happy when you moved to Featherweight. Uh, it looked like you're never going to be the taller man in a fight ever again. However, you're going to be the taller man come November 18th. How big of an advantage is that to you, Isaac? Because you've been having to deal with taller guys every time. Um, look, you know, you know, you know what they say. When life throws lemons at you, what do you do? You make lem lemonade out of it. And for me, yeah, I keep I keep saying this all the time, time and time again, is that I'm not the one that's fighting. In, in, I'm not the one that's fighting. You know what I mean? I believe that the spirit of the Lord that leads me into the battle and it leads me to the ring, and the fights are my battles for me. So when when I'm thrown against these guys at the featherweight division and you know, they are bigger guys, taller guys, and everything and stuff. Um, I don't really feel any different, you know. The only thing is that I know that at the end of the night, I'm going to come out victorious. And the days the days that I do not come out victorious, you know, I trust that God has a better plan for me. Um, you know, in in, in, in in regards to Nick Ball, who is coming in as a, as, as a, as a smaller guy, um... I think it's all about adjustment, really and truly. It's all about adjustment, because um, before I'm I'm having to like stand tall, you know, to kind of like accommodate uh, the style of the fight and everything else and stuff like that. But now, you know, we have to adjust as we're going along, and um, by God's grace, we'll see how everything, you know, everything works out on the night. Because it's all about things coming together, everything coming together on the night. And is there any pressure on you in this fight? I mean, obviously, you're the underdog. And I think that's interesting, by the way, that you're the underdog. But usually, the underdog doesn't really have the pressure on them. But I think there's maybe a lot on the line for you, actually. This is a bit of a must-win fight, in my opinion, for you. Is that fair to say, Isaac? Every fight is a must-win fight for me, you know? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't go in a fight thinking that, oh, when I win, uh, no, if I do not win, then this is going to happen, or when I win, that's going to happen. Every fight is a must win for me, and that's how I've always approached all the fights. I don't go in a fight expecting to be the, um, you know, expecting that, oh, this is going to be an easy fight for me, whether it, it comes close or not, they're going to give it to me because I'm the, because my name is Isaac Dogbe, or because you know, all because I'm the nicest guy that you come across now. Every fight is a must win. And this one, is, this, is, this is no different from all the other fights that I've been in. And you've only boxed as a pro in the UK just one time. It was Northern Ireland back in 2014. Are you excited to be boxing back in the UK here? Man, listen, I am ecstatic, honestly. When, when, when I got a call and, you know, I had other options. Um, to go away because obviously I was just like, oh wow, you know this, you know we've been talking about fighting in the UK for the longest time, well almost ten years now, I, I, you know if I if, if my if my calculations are right, and finally um, the opportunity has come, you know thanks to God and thanks to the people who are putting the show together, you know Queensbury and 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 to my other associate Top Frank, you know so. Um, I was, I'm, I'm excited about it. You know, it'll be a time. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be great to fight on the UK soil, and also to you know, to fight. You know, in the I mean, uh, before, before, before the UK UK fight then. And is it perhaps a sign of things to come? Maybe fighting again here in the UK. The fact that you're willing to work with all promoters. Do you think this could be a sign we might see you back again after this? Most definitely. Um, but God's special grace, you know? I mean, like, I've, I've really been wanting to fight in the UK for the longest time, like I said earlier. I've, I've, fought, around, I've fought around the world, you know. Um, I've fought around some of the, I mean, some some really, really nice places um, in terms of Ghana, the, um, America, uh, New Zealand, Switzerland, and all these places. So, um Listen, I'm I'm always I'm always up for a challenge. I'm always up for a good a good time. I'm always up for you know new adventures and new opportunities. And I mean, right now, um, I just I'm I'm thankful to God that these things are popping up and you know, um, 
you know, it would be, it would, it would be great. You know, I, I'm, I'm very, very grateful, man. And talking of coming back to the UK, I'm going to throw two names at you that definitely would get you back over here, uh, but they fought each other a few weeks ago. Lee Wood, Josh Warrington. Did you see the fight? And if so, what did you make of it? I saw the fight. Wow. Um, you know, I've asked to fight both guys on a numerous occasions. And I was told that, um, you know, their, their promoters had... Um, uh, different engagement for them, so I should just I should wait, you know. And I did wait my turn. And of course, th- these two guys are great fighters. I love how they fight. Um, I, the fight was great. Listen, I would love a scrap with with with, with Josh Warrington. I think that would crack. Uh, that would make a lot of headlines, honestly. But li- listen, you can't really um you can't oversee. I can't oversee what's in front of me. And jump into something different right now. I've got to take care of business right now, and then look onto what what is to happen in the near future. But these are five. These are two guys that I would love to fight because listen, they are also considered some of the best fighters to come out of the UK, and um, you know, it would be great to to mix up of them. Because listen, as essentially, when when history is being told, they are gonna say that well. Um, this person fought that person and it was a great fight. That person fought this person it was a great fight. You know, it's all about the excitement. It's all about everything. Just, you know, just putting, putting, putting yourself out there and, you know, fighting, fighting the best. And that's what boxing has been for me, to fight the best and essentially to reap the rewards that come with it. And, you know, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm ready for all of them. Honestly, I thought, um, to, I thought, Warrington was leading at that point until he got stopped, you know. But it just goes to show that, man, listen, this is boxing. Anything can change at any any time. And, I mean, Leo deserves it. Um, he's a champ, and um, he deserves everything that, everything good that comes with that victory, and I, I wish him well. I hope that, um, you know, they would also welcome me a fight with, with, with either of them. Yeah, hopefully we see it down the line. Um, I want to throw even Michael Conlon's name out there. Obviously, there's a fight that's supposed to happen before. I would still like to see that even in 2024. Um, Just before we let you go, Isaac, I always like to do this. I like to come to you for some closing words to the listeners. And you don't sign out your interviews the same way as everyone else does. A thank you, you know, thanks to my sponsors. No, no, no. You always give us pearls of wisdom that we remember forever. Please, if you have anything right now on the tip of your tongue, let's let's hear it. Bless our ears, please, Isaac. Oh, um, thank you, Joey. Um, I would love to say thank you to my sponsors. Um... <laughs> You said, you said, I feel this are different now. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, listen, um, it's always a pleasure talking, speaking with you, Joey. You know, you know, um, you you were you were also one of the people that were there, you know, from the beginning as well. And it's always been great, you know, to always connect with you guys, you know, and also to to, to have me on your platform. But you know, this one thing I, I would love to say before I leave is that. They say they say that um, everyone in their in their lifetime has to climb a mountain before they reach a level ground, right? And why do I say that? It means that the beginning of everything is challenging. Do you know what I mean? But if, if you do not climb up up that stairs or up that mountain, go through that 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 challenge or that difficulty, you know, how are you supposed to reach the top of the mountain where the level is grounded? You know, where where it is leveled, you know, and this is just an encouragement to everyone out there that at any particular moment in time, they will they will have they will come to a time where you have to you're gonna to have to climb that mountain, you know, in order to get to where you want to get to to reach that level ground that you want to get to, and even when you do get there, in order for you to move up onto the next step, you're gonna to have to climb another mountain again. You know what I mean? So it's just to say that, listen, whatever good that you're doing, keep doing it. 
whatever struggles you're going through, keep going through them. Whatever challenge you're going to go through, keep going through them. Because in a, in a, in, 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 in a very short, short, short while, you know, you're going to reach that point where you're going to look back down and see how far you've climbed and you're going to be proud of yourself and you're going to know that, oh my goodness, and I thank God that I've achieved what, what I set out to do. So always keep your head up, man. And um, the sky is the limit. There God bless. Go. There we go. I love it. I love it. You know, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a great way of saying, in other words, Isaac, you know, nothing worth having comes easy and you can only climb when you're in your prime. Of course. There we of go. Of course. There we and, go. And, 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 and just, to, just to add this one, listen, you know, we always have to thank, always have to be thankful to God because without God, nothing is impossible. You know, with God, all things are possible. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I mean, that's what, that's what, that, that's the code that I, I, I live by. Absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, Isaac, it's always a pleasure speaking with you, my man. You know that. Thank you for your time. Best of luck, November 18th. And we'll speak again sometime after the fight, my man. All right, mate. All right. Cheers. Thank you. And I hope to see you there, man. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. Going to start with this piece of news here, Eddie. I'm going to come to you straight away. Um, David Benavidez gets in with Demetrius Andrade. It's going to headline a, a Showtime pay-per-view Saturday, November 25th um, at the Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas. Um, I don't want you to go too deep on it, but thoughts? Great fight. I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, obviously, haven't seen much of uh, Andre, uh, re- you know, too recently. I mean, he's been, you know, he's had so many uh, issues, you know, back and forth with management or whatever, I guess. Hasn't fought that much. Well, he's fought a few, you know, some fights recently. But um, I think if he's good, primed and ready, it's an interesting fight. But if he's not where he needs to be, I mean, he's, he's, he could get steamrolled. Because we all, we all know that. David Benavides does not play for a second. He's coming in there to destroy, seek and destroy. So, uh, and he's got a great bit of skills as well going with going on with that uh, uh, with that aggression. So, I mean, it's going to be interesting. I mean, there's a lot that uh, Demetrius Andres has that you know he can throw in, but he's got to be on his A game to compete. So, interesting fight. Looking forward to it. Um, yeah, going to be very interesting. Yep, and the other piece of news is that an injury has forced the postponement of Josh Boazzi against Dan Aziz, which is a real shame for British boxing fans. We were looking forward to it. It was going to go down this weekend at the O2 Arena. The main event of that card has has collapsed, obviously. Dan Aziz with the injury, a back injury, um, which broke earlier this week. Um, not Not his back, but the news broke earlier this week. Um, anyway, the card still goes ahead, but there's been a venue change from the O2 Arena to York Hall now, um, which we'll we'll get into in a moment. But massive blow there for Boxer and Ben Shalom. Um, a lot of people were really looking forward to that fight. You know, it was going to be a great all domestic dust up, and I was I was really looking forward to it, to be honest with you. Um, anyway, moving on to the preview part, we're going to start tomorrow, Friday. October 20th at the Holiday Inn in Birmingham, West Midlands, United Kingdom. Um, There's every chance I've stayed in that hotel. But anyway, on the card, the main fight, the main event, we're going to see Ayaz Ahmed, 10-2 with three draws. He gets in in a rematch with Marcel Braithwaite, 15-3-1 for the vacant British Super Flyweight title. Obviously, the pair boxed in the past, and it ended in a very controversial draw. A lot of people felt Braithwaite won it. He did win it, to be totally honest with you, but yeah, Ahmed was lucky to get a draw. He loves a draw, by the way, Ahmed, and here they get it on again. They were supposed to get it on again sooner than this, but it got pushed back, and here we are. It finally goes down tomorrow. Uh, Moving now to Germany at the EWS Arena in Gopingen, over here, we're going to see Firat Arslam, 54-9 and nine with three draws. He's a 12-rounder for the WBA Gold World Cruiserweight title. He gets in with Edin Pujolo, Pujalo, I think it's said. 
Um, again, always worth mentioning the legend that is Firat Arslan simply because he's still trying his absolute best, actually. You know, uh, former cruiserweight world champion, but still trying his absolute best at the ripe old age of 53. So, yeah, all the best to him here. He gets in with this guy who is 35. Uh, he's 23 and 1 with 22 KOs. Um, but the bad thing is, he got knocked out by Dylan Prazovic. We've seen Dylan Prazovic come to the UK, he lost to Lawrence O'Coley, he lost to Isaac Chamberlain. He's not that great. All the best to Big Firat. Moving now to the York Hall, Bethnal Green. Um, this is the rest of the Buatzi Aziz undercard. We're going to see Louis Green, 16-3, and three, defending his Commonwealth title against Sam Gilly, friend of the show, 16-1. and one. That's over 12 rounds. Sam Gilly is, is the underdog for this one, so you can get a nice little price on him. I'd love to see him pull it off. I think he can pull it off as well. He's in some good form. All the best to him. We're also going to see Mikel Lawal, 17-0, defending his British Cruiserweight title, if I'm not mistaken. He gets in with Isaac Chamberlain, another really good fight, 15-2 and two Chamberlain, friend of the show, the extremely, extremely frustrating career, um, you know, his two losses have come to Lawrence Ocoli and Chris Billum smith two, you know, guys that went on to become world champions, yet he has just struggled so much to get things going, it's been such a, you know, a rough career really, since the loss to Ocoli, everything's just gone super slow for him. But here, you know, he gets in a big fight. Um, I think he probably saw himself at this point in his career, you know, the year 2023, probably going to be higher than fighting for the British title. But here he is. It's been extremely slow, like I say. He's quite a big favour against Mikel Lawal. Um, I'll be surprised if he has an easy night with him. Um... But I was quite surprised to see him as the favourite, actually. Also on the card as well, Karis Arting stall 4-0. It's an 8 two-minute round contest against Vanessa Bradford, who's 7-4-2. and two. Uh, Karis Arting stall probably going to go the distance again here, I'd say. She's still yet to get KO number one. Um, and yeah, she gets in with Vanessa Bradford, who's never been stopped. Been in there with some decent fighters as well, you know. Tiara Brown, Michaela Mayer, Alicia Baumgardner, Haya Michoy, Karis Brown. Um, so, yeah, she's been around the block. She has, 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 you know, fought some really good ladies in just her short pro career. Never been stopped. Uh, also on the card as well, Mick Hennessy Jr., 11-1 and one with a draw. Gets in with late replacement Joe Laws after Harley Ben pulled out the fight. Um, Joe Laws 13-2, and two. it's over 8 rounds there, I think that could be interesting by the way, wouldn't be surprised to see Joe Laws get the upset, he's about a 4-1 to one underdog, I think that's worth a small punt, moving now to the Echo Arena, unfortunately this show clashes with the York Hall card, it's going down on the zone this one of course, let's start with the undercard, Campbell Hatton 13-0, and o gets in with Jamie Sampson who's 9-2, and two. it's over eight, 8 rounds there at super lightweight, um, once again, it's another fight for Campbell Hatton. Is he going to get the knockout? Is he not? Um, and yeah, I, I think he might get it here. They're expecting him to get it. The thing about Jamie Sampson, I mean, he's never been stopped in his two losses. But when you look a bit a bit closer at his record, um, he, he came back with a, with, with a loss this year. He lost on points over six rounds to the undefeated Conor Gray. That was back in um, June of 2023. His last fight prior to that was back in 2014. So he actually took nine and a bit years out the ring. So I'm not sure what has gone on in that time. He didn't put on loads of weight. He came back at the pre at pretty much the exact same weight to the pound. But I don't know what he's been up to in all that time off. And, uh, you know, Ricky Hatton's son might just be a bit too fresh for him. We'll have to wait and see. Also on the card as well. Uh, the undefeated Khalil Majid, he is 11-0. and 0. He's back in an eight-rounder here against Tom Farrell, who's 21-7. and 7. Once again, you know, uh, Majid hasn't really fought anyone of note. You know, you look through his record, it's full of guys with losing records. In fact, just one guy on his whole record has got a winning record, and that was last time out. He went to points with this guy who was 9-4. and four. 
Um, and yeah, basically gets in with Tom Farrell. Tom Farrell's not in the best of form, but again, I wouldn't want to write him off here. He's not, like I say, been in the best of form, lost three of his last four. But I don't think he's a bad fighter at all. I mean, last time out, I was at his fight against Henry Turner. And I was really impressed with Henry Turner. But Henry Turner's absolutely massive. He's a massive puncher. Or he looked like a massive puncher. He was big and strong. And um, Khalil Majid, I don't think he's going to have that, that, that same kind of stature. That same kind of power. And for me, I would not be surprised to see this go the distance, but I wouldn't be surprised to see Tom Farrell pull off an upset, I think he's worth a little a little small punt there, but like I say, I think the fight goes the distance here, uh, also on the card, we have Shabazz Masood, 11-0, he gets in with Jose San Martin, who's 34-7 and with a draw that's over 10 rounds there um, again, it's a, it's, it's a really kind of weird fight, um Masood really impressed me, I think, in his last fight against Jack Bateson. Managed to get the stoppage. I was very impressed with that. But yeah, gets in with a, a very durable guy here. Um, 42 fight veteran from Colombia. Uh, went three rounds with Maurizio Lara. Got KO'd back in October of last year. Since then, he's had two fights, a win and a loss. Uh, went 12 rounds though with Emmanuel Navarrete back in 2018, got stopped in the 12th and final round, that tells me all I need to know, this guy's obviously going to be pretty tough, uh, pretty tough, Shabazz Masood probably for the points win there, um, very impressive boxer Masood by the way, all the best to him, uh, also on the card as well, Peter McGraw 7-0 in a 10 rounder at Super Bantamweight against Fran Mendoza, um, Fran Mendoza 17-0, like I say, undefeated, not a name that I'd heard of. I had a little look at him from Colombia, living in Spain these days. Um, again, bit of a padded record. Didn't really recognize anyone on his 17 wins. But, you know, you never know with guys like this. It's a massive step up for Peter McGraw, I suppose, in just his eighth fight. Um, he's, he's, he's done 10 rounds one time in the past as well. Fran Mendoza has never done 10. That could be quite interesting. Um but yeah, Peter McGraw's a good boxer, you know. I would, I would, I, I'd say he might win this one. It's tough, really. You never know with Colombians. They're, they're tough guys. Could go the distance. I don't know. But it's a weird fight. It doesn't make much sense. No belt on the line. Uh, this one's another another kind of strangeish fight, really. We're going to see Akib Fiaz 12-0 for the vacant Commonwealth Super Featherweight title over 12 rounds against Reese Bellotti, 16-5. Really, really like this fight because it's, it's just completely a bit of me, a bit mad, a bit unexpected. Akib Fiaz has managed to get himself to 12-0, and to be honest with you, he's been a little bit fortunate, you know? He's been a little bit fortunate. Um, he was down in his last fight uh, against Con Costin Ion. He was down there and, and just about managed to scrape a point. Uh, you know, the win by one point, 76-75, the scorecard in the end. But, you know, he hasn't looked that good. He was a good amateur, but it seems like it's, it's, it's been a bit of a struggle adapting to the pros. He gets in with Reese Bellotti, who, you know, you can say what you like about the guy. He can certainly punch, though. And I was at his last fight against Yusuf Kamari. He boxed absolutely brilliantly. Um, I should mention as well, both guys have got a victory against Dean Dodge. Both guys stopped him. Reese Bellotti did it quicker. Um... And yeah, that's the only time that Akib Fiaz managed to get a stoppage. It was in the eighth and final round. Um, yeah, so Fiaz, he's, he's, he's not going to get the respect from Bellotti. Bellotti knows that, you know, the guy can't punch as hard as him. The guy is not going to want to sit there and trade with him. So Bellotti's going to come and put the pressure on. And he's been in these kind of fights before, you know. He's been in with guys who are much better technical boxers than him and you know I think he's learned and I think he's actually got a bit better than what he was you know he was coming off at one point three losses in a row you know Jordan Gill Francesco Grandelli and then he went out there to the States I thought it was in the States actually it was in Eddie Hearn's back garden but lost to Raymond Ford looked horrible in that fight there but come back took a little break come back and he's in some good form now and he's actually the favourite against Akib Fiaz. But 2-1 to one for the KO, I think, is really, really overpriced. I think that's interesting. And the main event, Jack Catterall, 27-1 and one for the WBA Intercontinental Super Lightweight title. Gets in with Jorge Linares. 
47 and 8. Good to have Jorge back here in the UK. He's he's really in good form when he comes to the UK. Um, you know, he's been over here before, beat um beat Anthony Crawler twice, beat Kevin Mitchell as well. Um so yeah, I think he's three and oh with uh, with 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 one KO whenever he's come to the UK. However, he's not in great form. He's coming off three back to back to back losses and he gets in with Jack Catterall who obviously isn't known as the biggest puncher, but he's gonna be a lot bigger than Jorge Linares and Linares as well. I think has only had one fight at this weight, at this weight of 140. He's not really suited to it, and he got banged out in a round by Pablo Cesar Cano, and that one was four and a half years ago now. So a lot of people are expecting Jack Catterall to get him out of there, and uh, of course, if he doesn't hurt him with a punch, there's every chance he's going to cut him. He, he always ends up getting cut, Jorge. All the best to him though, and all the best to friend of the show, Jack Catterall. It's not the fight I really wanted, but. You know, I, I just feel sorry for Jack Catterall, man. Just give him a world title for free. He deserves it. Moving out now to the Kia Forum in Inglewood, California, USA. Over here, friend of the show, Joseph Jojo Diaz, 33-4 and four with a draw. He's back in a 10-rounder against Richard Medina, who's 15-1. and one. Um, I've noticed that the odds on this fight have got tighter and tighter and tighter, which is interesting. I'm hoping that Jojo has had a good... You know, training camp. Haven't spoke to him for a little while. Um, obviously, we had him on. You know, before before his last fight, I think it was. Came on the show, opened up about his addiction to alcohol, and it was a really powerful interview that we did. And I really liked JoJo a lot. Um, but yeah, gets in with a with a hungry fighter. The the guy's one loss was to Raymond Ford on points. I don't know that much about him other than that, but some people giving him a real chance here. Uh, also on the card, we're going to see for the IBF World Flyweight female title, a 10 2-minute round contest against or, or between Arely Musino, who's the champion, 32 and 3 with two draws. She gets in with the sister of the towering uh, Inferno, uh, Gabriella Fundora, 11 and 0. She is the favorite. She's expected here to pick up a world title. All the best to her. But yeah, she gets in with a very, very experienced lady, Musino. Only been stopped one time. And that was back in 2011. A bit of a kind of uh, unexpected one when she lost. She got stopped in, in two rounds to Ava Knight. So yeah, long, long time ago. Um, she's put together 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 wins, I think, in a row. But yeah, she's going to need... She's going to need some help from above to beat Fundora, Gabriella Fundora, who's looked very, very good since turning pro. And the main event, Alexis Rocha, 23 and 1. He gets in with Giovanni Santalan, 31 and 0. Uh, it is over 12 rounds for the WBO, NABO welterweight title. Alexis Rocha, the massive favorite. I think I can see why, you know. Rocha has impressed me, uh, really, really impressed me against Blair Cobbs when he knocked him out. That was a year and a half ago now. And he's been very active since then. He's had four fights, man. And, you know, he's won them all, of course, knocked out two of his last two. Gets in with Santalan, who I think I said in his last fight, you know, if he's going to get a, a big title shot or whatever, then he needs to get it now. You know, I think he's he's... He's putting a few a few miles on his clock now, and it's either now or never for him. Obviously, being a welterweight doesn't help because there's too many killers at that weight as well. And yeah, he's got himself to 31 and 0. Uh, he's southpaw. I think he was. I thought he was signed to top rank, but I've noticed he's obviously on this uh, Oscar De La Hoya show. I don't know if he is with top rank or not, but I'm pretty sure his last fight was on a top rank card. That's why I thought that. Um, yeah, 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 that's right, he boxed on the George Cambosos, Maxi Hughes undercard last time out, I remember watching that fight against Eric Bonnet, or Eric Bone, however you say his name, but yeah, Rocha, you know, it's, it's gonna be a good fight, it should, it should be a decent fight here, um, I've noticed that they're both southpaws, actually, um, but yeah, like I say, I haven't really seen much of Rocha recently, but he really, really impressed me against Blair Cobbs, he beat the hell out of Blair Cobbs, actually, and uh, should be a good one, should be a good one, there should be something big for the winner here as well, because, you know, it's two guys who are, 
I don't know, somewhere on that long list of uh, contenders, you know, guys that are worthy contenders at 147, and um, yeah, the winner should get, hopefully, some kind of bigger fight, but anyway, that brings the preview part to a close, I thought I'd be coming to you in this part, Eddie, but actually, we've pretty much flown through it quicker than I thought that, that we would have done, but yeah, that's 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 about that, so in part one, we did the review part, then we welcomed our special guest, uh, in part two, we did the news part, we've just wrapped up the preview part, the final thing for me to do is to come in with the outro, which I'll do in just a few seconds. Okay, and this wraps up episode 418 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A huge shout out to this week's special guest, the former WBO Super Bantamweight World Champion, Mr. Isaac Dogbay. The biggest thanks of all, though, goes out to you, the listeners. Thanks once again for tuning in. That's about everything from myself, though. Enjoy your weekends, people. Stay safe, and we shall see you all again next week.